Let me pray for us real quick. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being a God who knows us better than we know ourselves, who walks with us when we make mistakes, who is there to cheer us on, who guides us and leads us in every moment of our lives. Lord, help us to seek you and serve you with everything that we are. Be with our time together tonight. I love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good evening, students. If you don't mind, stand up. Let's worship the Lord. Sing some praise. And uh, it doesn't scare me if y'all clap, raise your hands, move around. So That was that. a joke. <laughs> yeah. Tough crowd, tough crowd. Tough crowd. Are y'all awake? <laughs> We're going to have fun and worship Jesus, right? Really? Are we? We're fun and worship Jesus, right? Here we go. That's better. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was mine Till I met I was breathing but not alive All my failures I try to hide It was mine too Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and i ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day now your mercy has saved my soul now your freedom is all that I know the old made new Jesus when I met you oh what a day when you called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day I needed a rescue, my sin was heavy. Chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. You call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open, cause when you call my name, I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness, into your glorious day, you call my name.
would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free. He has ransomed me, oh, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me, who the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child. Forsaken, 
glad you're a child of God. He calls us his own. We're going to enter a time of communion. Uh, y'all can be seated if you want. And as you're seated, uh, as y'all know, communion's on the side. Go ahead and get that. I did want to talk for just uh, a, a minute about the significance of communion. And I won't go into all of it because as I was thinking about it this afternoon, there's so much wrapped up in the act of communion. And it's, it's about symbols, right? And uh, Cameron had spoken about symbols very recently. And the symbols of communion, the, the wafer and then the juice, of course, the wafer represents Christ's body and the juice represents his blood. And symbols are really important in uh, Hebrew Jewish culture. And it was a reminder every time they uh, experienced Passover or participated in Passover of what God had done for them when he delivered them from slavery. And just like the Israelites or the Jews were uh, liberated from physical slavery, we're liberated from spiritual slavery to sin. And that's one of the things uh, that this represents. Christ's body, we partake of his body. We're part of him and his blood, which is represented by the Jews. So as y'all take that, I'd like for y'all to think about that. We're free from the slavery of sin because of what Christ did on the cross with the symbols of communion. Keep that in mind. And Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have to participate in communion. And you said in your word, as often as we do this, we remember you and your death until you come. And we thank you that one day soon, we'll partake of this with you in heaven. Thank you, Jesus.
my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name compares to your embrace the light of the world forever reign I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace the light of There we go. Say my props. I don't know if you guys know this about me. Um, sometimes before I go out, I still get really, really shaky as I sit back there. <laughs> I like shaking. Um, but something else you probably didn't know about me, or maybe you did, you might have. Um, I am really, really gullible. And I own that. I don't know if it's just the empath in me that's giving people the benefit of the doubt, um, or if sometimes I just genuinely don't know the truth. <laughs> but I could probably tell you a bunch of stories about how gullible I am. A lot of them actually happen here at work. Um, a few weeks ago, we were getting ready for Wednesday night service, and Cameron and I are in here, Cameron's our admin, Everyone say hi to Cameron, because he makes everyone do that when he's on stage. Um, and we were prepping, and we were waiting for David. Everyone say hi to David. David's back there, too. Oh, David, I felt like you didn't get as much of a hello there. Um, <laughs> so we were, we, were waiting, we were waiting for David. Um, everything was mostly done. We were just waiting for him to get there. Anyways, Cameron decides to tell me I'm sitting over on the couch. And he comes in and goes, hey, I just, I just got off the phone with David, and he's not coming tonight. And I was like, again, and me, I'm, I'm saying to myself, oh my gosh, like, what happened? Um, if he's not coming, it must have been like a really good reason, especially, and he had been corresponding with Cameron all day, so that's why I was like, oh, that's why he didn't call me. I just said, call me, you know, his boss. Um, that's why he called Cameron. <laughs> um, but I was like, oh my gosh, something must have happened for him to call Cameron right away. And Cameron's starting telling me why he's not coming, and he's saying, um, you know, this happened and this happened. And I'm believing, I'm like, okay, like, that all makes sense. I'm just, like, surprised because it's kind of last minute. But at the same time, if it was important, like, it's okay if it's last minute and you don't come into work because um, things happen. But then he gets this part in the story, and he goes, and now he's mad. He's mad at us. <laughs> so he's not coming to work because he's mad at us? <laughs> um, and that's how I knew that they were joking. But I think I was believing it, honestly, up until he got to that point. So he could have kept going if he um, reworded it. He was working on the spot, though, so he can do that. But it made me realize, like, I will honestly believe anything. And you can even ask my husband that, too. Um, but I know I'm not alone in that. And you want to know how I know this? Because, one, I'm sure a bunch of you guys will believe anything. And two, our new student pastor, Frank, started this week. Where is he? Oh, he's over there. Hi, Frank. Um, and his first day, yes, we can clap for Frank. His first day in the office was Monday. And you know, we're talking in, in our meeting. So it's Cameron, David, myself, and Frank. 
Cameron's a jokester, because I'm going to start off with Cameron again. Cameron makes the comment. So he made some comment about Pantano, and he goes, he said Pamtano. Like, instead of an N, he put an M, like Pamtano. Say it really fast. You honestly can't even tell. And so then David plays long and goes, yeah, that's what it's called. It's called Pamtano. <laughs> and I, you know, I try to play along and go, yeah. You, but you don't, you don't really talk about it much because you can't really hear the difference, so no one really brings up the weird spelling of Pam, even though we spell it P-A-N. And Frank is buying it. He's <laughs> buying this, that, that it's called Pam Tano. And he's wondering, this interview process, like how did he go through this whole entire process and not know the actual name of the church? He goes and talks to Roger, and I'm sitting there trying not to, like, I felt so bad. I was like, guys, you can't let him believe that. And, you know, we told him, obviously. Um, but people will believe anything. <laughs> um, in all serious, like, in all seriousness, though, um, I do feel like I believe a lot of different things before I know the actual truth. And sometimes it's just because it seems like, oh, that makes sense. Um, or so many people believe it that you start to believe it too. Whether it's things about God, I believed a lot of things that aren't true, um, or things about my purpose, or my identity, and then also relationships. But here's what I know. I'm not alone in believing some of these things. I had a conversation with my husband, Dustin, the other day in the car, and I was telling him I'm really excited for this upcoming um, series we're doing. It's a two-week series. And I was saying, um, like, why I'm so excited about this. And I said, it's because when I was, you know, in sixth through twelfth grade, I believed every lie in the book about what relationships and sex looks like. Um, but I, I really did. And even when I'd find out what the truth was in those things, I still believed it, and I kept believing these lies. And it hurt, <laughs> and it hurt badly, and I'd keep going back. And when I was prepping for this message, though, I was, again, I'm so excited and I'm grateful to be able to look back on those opportunities and say I'm so excited to invite you guys into some chapters of my life as I talk to you about some lies that the world might tell us. Um, but just know that prepping for this message did bring, it, you know, it made me think about my adolescence and <laughs> um, just some experiences and painful ones that happens when you believe the lies that the world tells us. But like I said, um, we're in a new series called Fake News, and David and I are going to be teaching the next two weeks. We are talking about the lies the world tells us about sex and relationships. The goal of this series <laughs> is really just to equip you all. You are going to hear so many different things about what the world tells you these things should look like but we just want to tell you some of the truth that we find in scripture about these topics when we see these lies getting told. Now, I have this cup. It's, I couldn't find a clear cup, so I'm using my Dunkin' cup from earlier. I didn't waste it, I finished it. But this is our, here's our example. Um, and we'll, I'll touch on this when I'm done. So this water bottle, this water bottle is a Christian who wants to date. <laughs> and she is right there. There she is. She wants to date. It might be a little cloudy because I didn't clean it all the way. <laughs> and this Pepsi is the person she wants to date. And what? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm wasting it. <laughs> um, but Pepsi, Pepsi isn't necessarily a believer. He doesn't know what he believes yet. He's not super strong in his faith. But this is Pepsi. And they're dating. So they're dating. I'm so sorry I wasted it. And they're just going to sit there. They're dating. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> um, I'm sorry I wasted it. Does somebody want the rest of it? <laughs> All right. Here's what I want to start with, is that God created us for relationships. He created us for a relationship with him, with others. Um, and others could be anyone, like friends family, or romantic relationships, which is where I'm going to land tonight, everyone's favorite topic. Um, this is my husband. If you don't know, I am married to a wonderful man named Dustin. He is so great. He's right there. Um, we, um, we're, new, 
newlyweds. We just got, we just celebrated six months of marriage on Sunday. And Dustin, <laughs> Dustin is a teacher at Desert Christian High School. Um, but yeah, so that's Dustin. And I'm going to reference him probably a few times tonight. Um, obviously, that's who I'm in a relationship with. And, um, but now you guys have a, a face to go with it, if you didn't already know. But like I said, there was a point in my life where I believed the same lies time after time, and all that that left me was hurt and empty and confused. And these are all lies I believed about relationships. And some of these lies I probably believed while I was dating Dustin, and even in like an engagement period. <laughs> um, and I want you to know, I, growing up, I, I was one of those like boy-obsessed <laughs> Um, middle school and high school girls. <laughs> but, you know, we weren't, I wasn't always like dating somebody, but we, we might have been talking or we didn't have a label on it, but we basically were dating. Um, maybe they were seeing other people, whatever. But it always left me wondering where we stood. And I felt this way after giving people everything I had, <laughs> whether it was my time or energy or vulnerability. And I was still left feeling just lost and confused. But I want you guys to know something right off the bat is that God's intent for romantic relationships is not to leave you hurt and confused. And I am so sorry if that's how some of you guys have ever felt in one. Because I know dating starts young these days. Um, but that is not God's intent. And that's not what he created relationships for. You're not supposed to be in a constant state of wonder or confusion or just always feeling hurt and sad. It's not the intent at all. But I'm going to, we, and when we believe certain lies the world tells us, that is where we're left, is hurt and confused. And I'm going to be touching on three big lies that I believe the world is constantly telling us today. And the first one is that a relationship will complete you. Newsflash, it won't. <laughs> um, but we see and hear this in everyday life, and we don't even realize that's what we're being told because it just seems so normal. <laughs> and it's easier said than done to not fall into this trap that, this relation, that a relationship is going to complete your life and give you the fullest of lives. Sometimes when Dustin and I are going to watch a movie at night, I always say, like, well, what are we watching? And he likes to say, well... I don't want to watch like a rom-com or I don't want to watch something where I know the ending within the first like five to 20 minutes. But those are my favorite kinds of movies, aren't they? A good rom-com. But the world's idea of romance is a non-realistic one. The world's idea of life is, movies idea of life is non-realistic because you fall in love, you have this fairy tale ending, it's this love without conflict Minus, you know, the hour and 20 minutes of conflict, but then the ending, and then you don't see what happens after. <laughs> that is not ideal. The world's idea of a full and complete life means that a relationship is the end game. You work so hard for this relationship, and then your life is full. <laughs> that is a lie. Because life doesn't become perfect, and your life isn't complete as soon as you get into a relationship. As soon as you make it official or you have a title. <laughs> um, but this is what the world wants us to believe. That once you have it, it's fine and it's good and it's perfect. But again, that's a lie. Because the truth is there will always be some sort of dissatisfaction in an earthly relationship. You could have the best relationship on the planet with the greatest significant other but they will still fall short, no matter what. Even in marriage. Um, imagine my shock. <laughs> um, you think getting married is going to change anything. It doesn't. In the same way that when you start dating, when you've been talking to a person for three weeks, and you're like, they're going to ask me out soon, they're going to ask me out, and then you start dating, and it is the same thing as when you were talking. <laughs> um, the person is always going to fall short. Because true satisfaction and joy and fullness of life comes from Christ. And again, it's so much easier said than done to really lean into that and believe that. And I, I know that. In John 16, 
verse 22 through 24, it says this. So also, you have, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. And that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Our joy is made complete and full in Christ and nobody else. When the world says that love and a relationship is going to complete you, scripture and truth says that his love and a relationship with him will complete you and give you life to the full. His love will bring you, and this relationship will bring you, the fullest of lives. In John 10, 10, it says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. When we believe that a relationship is what completes us, that joy that you receive from it and that fullness that you might feel temporarily, it's going to go away and it's going to get taken away quickly or painfully and slowly. The point is, is that it doesn't last. But when we make the choice to believe that life to the full is in Jesus, it strengthens all of our relationships because your joy is made full in him and nobody else. But relationships can still bring you joy. I'm not saying they can't. Mine does. Like I said, I'm going to reference Dustin a lot. I love Dustin. He's great. (laughs) And he has brought me a lot of joy. Who Dustin is has brought me a lot of joy. But who Dustin is is because of Christ and not because of myself. I did not make Dustin do the person he is today. Granted, we bring out different personality traits and Sometimes those are really great, and sometimes they can be really, really hard. (laughs) He's laughing because he knows it's true. (laughs) Um, But another lie that we tend to believe is that we can change our significant other. And we're talking about faith and lifestyle, and we tend to say things like, well, they're the exception, or I'm the exception. They dated all these people before, and they were the same, but for me, it's going to be different. (laughs) I'm going to change them. I have, like, this magic touch. No. No, you don't. (laughs) We can't change our significant other. But again, you can bring out different personality parts, traits in them when you're with them. But red flags don't change when you put a title on something. When you are in a relationship, those red flags are not going to go away. There is no exception (laughs) to that. Because we are not in charge of our significant other's faith and relationship with Jesus. But I want to look at this, this couple right here. <laughs> um, Pepsi, no, water, was our super strong Christian who really wanted to be in a relationship. So she started dating Pepsi. And now look at... <laughs> you can't even tell that there was water in here. It kind of just looks lightened, I guess. Um... But a person, they have these two extremes, and over time, you know, your habits coincide. (laughs) The people that you hang around with, you kind of start to act like them, even when you don't realize it. And it happens sometimes really quickly. This happened right away. (laughs) Yikes. Um, (laughs) But sometimes it happens slowly but surely. And over time, you might get to this point if both people, if you think that you're going to change them. And again, there might be little, little changes, like, look, it's a little bit lighter. But the water changed, too, um, because some parts of your life are going to trickle over. And again, sometimes it's really good things. You might notice that your senses of humor might line up, and you're like, oh, yay, that's wonderful. In 2 Corinthians 6.14, it says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? We cannot believe that someone's lack of faith will strengthen because of our strengthened faith. It's not our job to change someone's heart. But we are called to love people, but not necessarily change them. I'm not saying that you can't be friends with somebody who is not a believer. What I'm saying is, 
the best option is probably just to be friends with them. Because you're, if you guys aren't growing together in Christ, you're not going to be growing together in a relationship. And this can be hard. <laughs> because you're saying, that's why I'm with them. You want what's best for that person. You want to see them find Jesus and find that life to the full. And you're saying, that's why I'm staying with them. I'm going to see it. But like I said, it is not your job to change their heart. But even if you want them to get there and you are ignoring all of the obvious red flags about it, or you could say things like, well, we're not dating, so it's fine. Well, if you're acting like you're dating, if it looks like, what is it, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck, <laughs> that kind of thing, you can put whatever name you want on it. But you're still giving them a piece of who you are. You're still inviting them into this space your life, your vulnerability, and you're still craving this attention from somebody. And that's damaging. It's so damaging and it hurts. And like I said, you can be friends with these people and that can help not only grow their faith, but yours too. Getting to walk alongside somebody hand in hand to see them truly learn who Jesus is and you getting to be the hands and feet of Jesus and showing them that as a friend. A godly relationship won't grow unless both people are committed to the relationship with Christ. That is the truth. Because um, God will change both of your hearts over time. God will change your heart in a way that prepares you for a godly relationship. Your worth and identity will be, find, will be found in how God views you and in how God changed your heart. But that's the other lie we tend to believe, is that your worth is found in how your significant other views you. And I believed that for so many years. Um, and it took, again, it took years to unlearn that, that is not where my worth comes from. It does not come from somebody else and how they view me and my appearance and my personality. <laughs> And again, I, I believe this about people who I wasn't even dating. I just wanted somebody to see me. And I would always ask my, this question, why am I not enough? I'd sit there and just wonder, <laughs> what is it about myself? And it makes it in this, it's all about me situation. I've told this story before, um, but in the summer of 2017, I was like, madly in love with a guy that I worked with. Um, <laughs> I say that. That's just me being dramatic. <laughs> we hardly knew each other at the time. But I, <laughs> I, I thought I was, and I was so excited to be like, I really, really like this guy. I think he likes me back. He was showing all the signs, as, or so I like to believe. Um, and I just remember we had a conversation at work one day, and he tells me, oh, I really like this girl. Or it had come up in conversation, and I, I was devastated. Because <laughs> I was like, what? I'm shocked. <laughs> um, but I remember when I found out, I ran downstairs to the basement of the church where our office was. And I'm like on the ground in like a fetal position, kind of like this. <laughs> kind of like you see in movies. Very dramatic, bawling my eyes out. My mentor was there with me. And I'm asking, why? How did I get here? Why am I not enough? Because in that moment, somebody telling me, oh, I don't like you, to me it equaled, you're worth nothing, Amy. Your worth was going to be measured in how much this person liked you. And because they didn't like you at all, I was worth absolutely nothing. And it hurt, and I wondered, why does nobody love me? Because that's where I found my worth. <laughs> um, but I, wanna, I wanted to ask myself, if I could go back, I'd say, what would have changed if that person told me that at the time? Oh, I really like you. I would have been, you know, high on that, that conversation for a little bit. But again, earthly relationships are going to fail no matter what. Not fail. They will fall short in ways. It's just human nature. We hurt each other, even if we don't mean to. But if that's where I put all of my worth, all of my eggs were in this basket with this person, um, it was gonna, 
eventually fall short and I would have been dissatisfied with the situation regardless. Because I did not find my worth in who Christ created me to be. Relationships are not all about you. And when you have this mindset that your worth is found in how the other person sees you, that's where we land. <laughs> when I, Dustin and I were dating, we had this joke. And Dustin and I would make jokes like, it's my world, Dustin. You're just living in it. Um, <laughs> um, it's not funny, but it is funny. <laughs> um, but that joke to me just rings... That's how we can view earthly relationships sometimes, that it's all about us. Everything is about one person, not the other, whatever that is. We make it about us and not about Christ. In Galatians, it says this, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Switching our mindset from ourselves to God allows us to lean into how God views us instead of how somebody else does. God calls us chosen, and he calls us loved and wanted, regardless on if somebody else says it to us, too. Again, nothing would have changed that day if that person told me, I really like you, too. I might have felt for 20 minutes like, oh, my gosh, we're going to date. Fun fact, we did date, and we're married now. Um, but, again, that took time. <laughs> but I had to get there, too, because I, I, at that point in time, I was still finding my worth and how other people viewed me. My mentor once asked me, is God's love strong enough for you to feel good about yourself, or do you need someone else for that? And she said that to me less than probably two years ago because it's something that I still tend to struggle with, and maybe not necessarily with Dustin, but probably sometimes that too, but with the people around me in other relationships. And it's such a good question to ask yourself, though. Is God's love strong enough for you to feel good about yourself and for you to find your worth in? Or are you relying on somebody else to give you that? Finding our worth and how others view us was always going to equal pain. And again, there's always going to be some sort of dissatisfaction, no matter what. But one of the biggest truths I ever had to learn was that God has already declared us worthy of love and a relationship with him. Again, regardless of what anybody else has to say or how they view us. My life verse is Psalm 139, 14. And it says, I praise you before I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. This is where your worth comes from. Not by how someone else views you. Not by a compliment you might get or who you're dating. This is what the Lord has declared over you, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made with, with or without a relationship. But the world will constantly tell you lies about what a relationship is supposed to look and feel like. And like I said, I fell for every single lie in the book. Everyone. <laughs> All of them. And I didn't always get the whole dating thing right. In fact, for the majority of my adolescence and college years and even young adult years and still now, <laughs> I probably get the majority of it wrong because I'm still learning what godly relationships look and feel like. But I'm learning, and I'm grateful to have a husband who's learning with me. I really am, um, in more ways than you ever could imagine. Because it is an answer to prayer and an answer to a life of mistakes and sin that here I am and I am happily, again, with mistakes being made married to a man who I know loves Jesus and is pointing me towards him. But we can't buy into the lie that these relationships will complete us because the Lord does that. And he's going to change our heart and your, your heart and my heart. And whoever is out there for you, he's going to change their heart too. And when we find our worth in him and not somebody else, we get to see relationships and life to the full and to their full potential. And I challenge you to think through some of the lies that you might have been told about relationships and what they look like. It could even be some of the ones that I 
talked about tonight. I challenge you to find what the Lord has to say about them and how will that change your perspective on romantic relationships. I'm going to pray and then we are going to start our game. Heavenly Father, thank you just for the ultimate relationship with you. You are good and you are so faithful. And I pray that these students and leaders can see that in their lives. They can see your goodness and your faithfulness to them and to the people around them as well. Lord, I pray just godly and healthy relationships um, over these students and leaders. Um, Friendships and romantic relationships, I pray that they lean into your truth and in what you have to share with them about what a relationship should look and feel like. In your name we pray, amen.